action under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we will begin with the school committee chair report. Um, tomorrow night there will be a city council meeting that will likely confirm um, the additional funding needed for net school spending this year of 700000 um, and we are working on uh, not only getting that approval, but also the goal of meeting net school spending for this year. So this will take us, I think, most of the way. Uh, moving on to the resource committee. Uh, resource committee, no report at this time. And the policy committee. Uh, the policy committee met last week, uh, talked about um, additional language for the health care procedures and protocols. Um, so that'll be making its way eventually um, for, for reading. And then um, there's action tonight on the removal of a policy. Um, so that'll come up later in the night. Okay, and student support. Um, we will be meeting on Monday the um, 2nd, and that will be at uh, 5.30. So hopefully we'll see people here. I'm trying to reach out to more individual parents who really are concerned about student support. We cover curriculum, we cover student life, we cover the arts and sports and science and everything else. So everyone has our minutes. Uh, Matt, Jean, anything to add? No. Okay. And Patty will get everyone the minutes probably in our next packet. Okay. And negotiations? Uh, Real school key. personnel? Uh, we held a meeting with the teachers this afternoon. That uh, went very well. Uh, we have uh, meetings scheduled this week with three other uh, of our unions, and uh, we will continue meeting. Okay, moving on to the approval of the meeting minutes from October 5th. Make motion we report. Second. Yeah. Motion made and second. Any questions, comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, there is no executive session tonight, so moving on to business or communications. Okay. I've got a few communications. Um, I'm not sure whether the superintendent were um, meant to say this, and I guess I'll, I'll leave it for um, the um, Adam and Adam to... Um, talk about the Crocker Crocker Elementary School playground are you here to speak about that I'm going to speak about this beautiful wonderful yeah it's this was this was this was wonderful this was I saw it on Facebook I'm amazed um, my communication is I have two one is that a really noted author lives in our community his name is R.A. Salvatore and he is the author of many many fantasy books he grew up in Lemonster. He still lives in Lemonster. He sold over 20 million books. Um, he's a New York Times bestselling author. And we have him at the Fitchburg Library. He will be part of Authors Night on Thursday, October 22nd um, at uh, 6.30, and that's free. There will be re refreshments. I do have postcards here, so if anyone in the room would like postcards, please come. Uh, they also have them at the library. But this is a rare opportunity. I think the last time he had a public appearance might have been as a guest speaker at Fitchburg State Commencement. So this will be a very intimate opportunity to hear him read. Uh, my other announcement is uh, Twin City Paws. We are a fellowship for pet support, advocacy, and education. We will be at Fitchburg High School tomorrow with therapy pets during the lunch hour. We love seeing um, students. We always see new students who come visit us. We'll have a, a couple of uh, different pets, possibly more than two. But we are doing a fundraiser. We have pumpkins to benefit Twin City Paws. Their uh, price ranges go from like 5 to 25. They are decorated with paws. It is a unique, artistic, um, handmade, artisanal pumpkin. And you can um, get one by contacting me, Sally Cragen, at verizon.net, or find our, our Facebook um, page, Twin City Paws. But these are very festive for desks, and I'm looking at folks who have desks, which I think is everyone in the room. Uh, everyone in the room here has a desk. So if you need a pumpkin, come talk to me. Thank you. I'd add an announcement. I don't know if, um, Andre, you were going to talk about this, but the Hungry Heart documentary, are we talking about that? The, yeah, that um, October 26th, Wednesday at 6 um, at Money Tech, uh, there's a screening of the film Hungry Heart, the Hungry Heart, a documentary, uh, and it looks at the um, world of prescription drug addiction. Um, and kind of fits in at this point with a lot of initiatives that people are taking about 
the opioid crisis um, in the area. So I've, um, I know there's some interest moving around. A few parents are kind of getting back and forth to each other, and they're all going to attend. So just if people aren't aware of that, it might be a, a good documentary to check out. Great. If there's no further communications, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. First, um, <clears throat> just want to let the community know that um, we've sent out, saved the date for the second annual Fitchburg Public School Gala. Uh, this year, uh, Fitchburg High School will be celebrating its 150th graduating class. So we're going to tie that theme to the gala, and hopefully between now and the time of the gala, uh, the day of the gala, which is Saturday, April 30th, uh, and it'll be at Fitchburg High School again. Um, so it's going to we'll get tickets out early this year, but uh, we're getting a jump on it. We had over 250 people attend last year with a two-month uh, upfront window, so I can imagine that we'll do very, very well uh, this year. So uh, watch for these. Uh, they will be out and about on the schools. They're up on the FPS First website. Um, they're on Google docs, uh, making them accessible to everyone. So save the date, and it will be again to benefit the after-school programs uh, for the Fitchburg Public Schools. Uh, now it is with great pleasure that uh, we invite uh, our two um, mascots, I guess the, for whatever the name would be, the Red Raider. Uh, so I'll have you both come and talk about what you do, the enthusiastic role you play, um, in all of our assemblies and sports. Uh, welcome, Red Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you introduce yourselves also. My name is Marissa Falconer. I'm a senior at Fitchburg High School. My name is Tanner Hansen. I'm also a senior at Fitchburg High. Okay. So some of the things we do at the mascots are at pretty much all football games and select sporting events such as basketball. We get up in these, give or take, <laughs> depending, <laughs> and we pretty much just show our support, not just for the teams, but for everybody who shows up. Because at that point, yes, we are there to support the football teams, the basketball teams, but the biggest thing is they're doing it, but we are showing that even the fans deserve the support because without them, there's not really anything to go off of. Because the more people we get to go and the people that show up, show that we're doing something right. Um, yeah, going off of what he said, we just try and bring the school together in, in a whole. This year, I've really noticed that all the classes have joined together and are just having a lot of fun. Uh, so what we have done so thus far is my first order of business when I was elected Raider was that I made a Twitter page. And with my Twitter page, I branch out to all my followers, which are Actually, Mr. Roach is one of them, <laughs> and I have a lot of people from our school, majority of people who attend games, and I tell them what's going on, events that are going on in the school, like Spirit Week, keep them up to date. And then another way I communicate with the school is that I put up posters, and I have our secretary make announcements of what's been going on, such as like on red and gray days, make sure everyone wears red and gray. Red and gray days are on Fridays. Um, and then along with Red and Gray Days, I've had like competitions. I bought like wristbands that say like Red Raiders on them. And I painted out to people who have worn the most to give them some recognition, make them feel good. Um, and then also for games, what we have done together is planned out themes for games. So our first football game was like a bright out, our second was a blackout, and our third was an America theme. And these are what like the kids want, so we just help lead and really just join everybody together and get them all excited to be a part of FHS. I think, I think a big thing I've brought up what she said is that um, there's almost been a stigma put onto public schools such as, oh, it's a public school, anybody can go there, so it's not the best learning establishment. But the thing is, our school has been producing greatness for years and years. The writer that we came into, his name is Merrick, he's on Broadway now. Who knows where we're going to end up? For all we know, we could be working as executives. We could be on Broadway like Merrick. We have no idea. All we know is that FHS, it has been producing greatness, and our students are proof of that, considering the scores on our test, SATs, MCAS. Wait, did we get rid of that? 
<laughs> I, keep hearing, I keep hearing that we have. I want to guarantee. I want, I want you guys to. You just summarize the whole political <laughs> debate. <laughs> That's right. Is there MCAS? Is this still a thing? Or what, maybe. Question of the moment. <laughs> but yeah, definition. FHS has been producing greatness, and our students, our faculty, are worth it, considering. Our teachers, no matter, even, yes, we have our days when we are pains and we don't <laughs> want to do anything. I improve t sometimes. But the thing is, even with that, we still never give up. That's the Red Raider way. We do not stop. We just push back harder. Yes, there are days we don't want to do our work, but our teachers will keep pushing us to do it, and that's what produces greatness in our school. That's great. May I ask a question? Sure. So, what do you so you get elected to your position? Yes. Yes. So, do you make a speech? Do you give a cheer? Like, how do you get elected? <laughs> when it's time for, at the end of every year, there's elections for class office going into the upcoming year, and as seniors, it's a privilege mm. to become a raider. And what you do is, after uh, all the speeches for like president, mm. historian. We run as well, the same way we they do. We make a speech oh, and then we get elected in. The only real difference is that um, I'm not sure if the I'm not 100 if the others have this, but we have to get um, a, a pamphlet filled out of about 20 or so people that think we would be good at this job, and then we have to turn it in, and then we have to submit also a paper sent, pretty much giving detail of why we want this position, uh, why it is the best for us, and really what we can give back to the school. And then in front of our entire class, depending on if we run opposed, run alone, we still give it to the class to let them know who we are and what we stand for. That's great. So how do you choose your outfits? Because I remember <laughs> Merrick clearly would, I think, paint his entire body blue or something like that. <laughs> I stand by this, though. Merrick is still one of my favorites. He's, Red, blue. But I think the biggest thing is that they kind of give us free range on that as long as it kind of gives that whole, I want to say ferocity, but it, it, it shows off how much spirit you have. I was misled by Quinn Cavaco. He said on the first day of school, I'm going to be led into this room. There's going to be a suit in a vault, and it's going to be waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that. But we had to, yeah, we just purchased them ourselves, mm. kind of our imagination. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's, I like how they give us the idea of you can choose anything from this range without going too overboard and without going too under because mm -hmm. we've had variants like we've had um who was the one two years ago when we were sophomores um is right before they started electing female raiders queen okay i thought i wasn't sure i don't do names but um like his wasn't the most extravagant his was pretty much just a hat and a beard and i think like a kilt kind of thing mm -hmm. and then like, as you said, Merrick's was, he put on the football gear, did paint everything, and then the previous ones, they had um, almost like Roman garb, and now we have what we have. <laughs> nice. Who's got the most spirit at Fitchburg High? What class? <laughs> seniors. Uh, seniors. Seniors. Oh, that's good. seniors and sophomores. Mm. All right. I say sophomores are pushing back this year. Mm. <laughs> oh, we don't give them up. Yeah. <laughs> are they split the, the school? They're taking up guests. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's great. It's yeah. always fun to see you at the games and see you at the rallies. Uh, and uh, again, it's unparalleled, actually. No one here understands and gets it. But if you go to other school districts and other schools, you really don't usually see this level of dedication to tradition and and uh, support and all of that. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for having Above us. Above and beyond. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so are, are you all Thanks. set for costumes and things? Because I have a children's deal. <laughs> <laughs> She's got costumes. You could change With Viking outfit every day. <laughs> yeah. 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 I could get to Sally's yeah. barn. Thing. Every day she has changed. Yeah. I'm going to tell thing. Yeah, you've got the Viking red thing going too. So okay, actually, yeah. I told the class if I had become Raider, I was gonna dye my hair. <clears throat> I've currently been keeping up with it. I just for having to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, don't slip. You know. <laughs> um, just while we're on the topic of uh, great students doing great things, I know it was in the Sentinel and we posted it on FPS first, but um, I think it's really important to call out the uh, Lunenburg uh, seniors. Um, there was. Um, what could have been a, a, a bad incident of tagging and the like, and uh, 
it's just amazing. The Lunenburg seniors reached out to the seniors at Fitchburg High. Uh, they joined together at Hollis Hills uh, for a, a get-together and a fundraiser, and now they're planning another one. Uh, but it was really, you know, to me anyway, a testimony that left to their own devices, we always think that teenagers can do the wrong thing. But mostly what I see is left to their own devices, they can do the right thing. And they often do. Uh, and was one of the quotes that Jeremy s said was that this was all driven by the seniors themselves. This is not a group of adults saying this is what you're going to do. So it was um, really an, an, an affirmation, you know, of the quality and the ability of students and what they can do. Um, so <clears throat> these rivers of time have been up here for a while. Uh, it was designed by Gail Stone many years ago. Bloom. And, Bloom. Uh, Dale, I'm sorry, Gail Bloom. I knew a Gail Stone many years ago. Uh, Gail Bloom. And um, it actually kind of sat dormant for a while. And then a couple of years ago now, I worked with Gail to kind of bring it alive in these, ban in these uh, mounted uh, montages. And, uh, but what was missing was an explanation of it. Uh, you can kind of look at it and see that it's really a history of Fitchburg, uh, and there was a lot of great events, uh, but standing alone, one might walk right by it. So last year, McKay um, Arts Academy, working with Fitchburg State University and the departments at Fitchburg State, with, can, which can do this kind of recording, um, created uh, this plaque which you can see at the right-hand side. And these plaques now have been mounted in all the schools where this River of Time is located. And it has a QR code on it so that um, just like you would with anything else, you can go up and with your QR code, you can access the video which talks about it. So I'm going to have Eileen show you how it works. Uh, and we're just going to do a portion of the video. It's 12 minutes long, but we're going to listen to about five minutes of it to give everyone at home a demonstration of, of what it is. So I'm just casting from my phone now, but um, basically I've downloaded a, a QR barcode reader. There are any number of them. Um, so this one was living on my phone. Basically. Time. It was working right before. I know. <laughs> There's some people fooling around with the machine, I think, yeah. too. Normally, you would just watch it on your phone, but for this, we're showing how, project, trying to project trying it. To, um, yeah, to be able to demonstrate how that. It's on Mackay's website if you want to see it. I think I'll just go there too. Yeah. 
is an X up at the top. That's the audio. Yeah, I can hear it on the phone. It's the problem with my little phone to maximize the screen. short of having to restart my phone, I can bring just bring it up to you here. Would it be too much feedback to go to a microphone with the phone? <laughs> You'd probably blast it out. Huh? Where we need those Vikings to do some sort of an intuition. <laughs> or Sally, you could sell some pumpkins or something. I was just about to buy her pumpkin. <laughs> oh, you're. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you can I, sell pumpkin. Camera zooms in on the mayor giving Sally money for. <laughs> Well, I think, Matt, you, you had one of the readers for this, right? Isn't yeah, your... Yes, uh, one of the voices is familiar to me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were a reader for this? Uh, no, my Your son, son my was? Son, he's oh. one of the readers on this. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Um, I mean, Bob, do you want to talk about the donation or school choice funds during this interim? Yeah, we can. Sure. So, um, <coughs> 614, number 1516, uh, in continuation of the meeting last week where uh, Dick, or last week's <coughs> meeting where Dick Vaughn presented um, a recommendation <coughs> to fund the uh, student leadership training program, and that'll be for year <coughs> 18 to 20, which actually it, it'll be for getting a discounted rate by prepaying some of that. Um, <coughs> That is the only school choice. Request on tonight's <coughs> agenda. The Pearson's royalty, I think we we all know about that. that. That goes back to that program with ELL. Mm -hmm. <coughs> where some of our teachers develop that curriculum that's being used, and whenever it gets used, we get royalties for that. And then uh, 1612 um, is, in the, um, is at South Street, and it's a uh, buddy bench that was purchased. So when... Um, purpose of that is if a student is feeling kind of not part of the crowd, um, particularly, they can go sit on this bench and that's a signal to all the other kids that somebody should go sit with this person and make them feel more be connected. Friend. Make Be their friend. That's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well. So that's, um, that's a new, thank you all set. Mention the grants. Cover the rest yeah, of the Yeah, why don't you talk about it? Here we go. To help guide your journey through the river of time. Created by local artist Gail Bloom, the river of time is a journey through time. Created by local artist Gail Bloom, the river of time is a visual chronology that depicts the great history of Fitchburg, Massachusetts. This audio tour began as a small collaborative project between the K Arts Academy and the Communications Media Department at Fitchburg State University. Over time, it expanded to include Fitchburg Access Television, a local community-based nonprofit organization. Many people helped to produce this guide, and we truly hope the guide increases your understanding and enhances your experience. Here is project creator, Gail Bloom. <laughs> to honor the past, to imagine the future. This piece is an attempt to visualize the exceptional history of the region, its spirit and its people, with Fitchburg as its focus. My research and historical investigations started with a study of the earth, the Nashua River, and the inhabitants of its fertile edges. 
As I examined the spiritual threads of the community, I decided the voice of the earth and our Native Americans, who had inhabited this continent for more than 9,000 years, deserve much more space than I had originally intended. Across the panels, regional activities became interwoven with the beginnings of democracy as the United States became a nation. And as the photos started falling onto the timeline, the exceptional spirit of Fitchburg was made evident by the distinctions the citizens had drawn for themselves and the decisions they made as a region and part of a larger nation. Not only can a distinction be drawn because of the unusual quantities of industry and invention, but also with a study of the city's outstanding achievements, the inherent appreciation of creative thought, respect for art and education, and the expressions of new immigrant groups. In this study of Fitchburg's history, there exist cycles of failure and success, hard work, and continued examples of investigation, inspiration, and productivity. We can also see the recognition of new voices and a spirit of reconciliation as mistakes are rectified. Join us in a journey to all the golden years of thought, invention, and expansion in Fitchburg. So, that's the teaser. If you'd like to see it, uh, you can either um, use this or, Lourdes, did you say this was on the, so on the McKay <laughs> Arts football. Academy website? Uh, people can go there and look at it, and we probably should put a link to it. Do we have a link to our main page? Yes. Okay, so really great. Thank you, uh, Gail, and everyone who worked on this. It's mm -hmm. really, uh, and uh, Was Arthur. Uh, is the company that uh, printed all of these for us and mounted them, and they did, they did a really spectacular job. Okay, River of Time. Now we're ready for the school updates, and we will begin with Fitchburg High School. Jeremy? Okay, thank you. Just getting it set up here. Um, so, so reviewing, uh, I think you have, I think you have the slides. Yep. Is that right? Oh, okay, perfect. So, uh, working through uh, what we have, I'll touch upon a number of things. Um, this is not working, so I'm going to just move this ahead a little bit. The the main, you know, thing that I think we're starting. You know, as an update for the year, as we have a, a, a adopted a new master schedule, so that's a big uh, initiative for us at the high school. It's it's definitely going to be, you know, I think a focus of um, you know our analysis this year in a lot of ways, and in terms of what it's offering our students and faculty, and and also what we you know sort of need to look at in terms of you know modifications to that because there's no perfect schedules. Thank you. Uh, I think we're probably at about slide. Four, maybe. Yeah. So, so you can see it there, and I know that you have it in your um, in your packets as well. But initially, it seems to be going well. The feedback that we've gotten um, informally, and we plan to do uh, a questionnaire of some sort in our advisory to kind of get feedback from students about it. But initially, it seems to be to be going well in terms of. Um, you know, the students like the, the period length. They like having the additional period. They like dropping the periods in, in a lot of what I've talked, you know, to them about. On the flip side, and, and staff, I would say the same. Um, on the flip side, there's, there's also some drawbacks to that, too. So we've figured out a few tweaks that, 
you know, avoiding certain dropping of periods twice and so forth. So uh, it'll be good to look at it, but initially it seems to be working pretty well. Um, we also have a new administrative structure. Uh, you know, we did um, welcome back Mr. Casenza to a more active role in, in working with the students beyond just the, the very big role he already has with athletic director. So it's been great. Ray and I, uh, really, he takes the lead on most of it, but we've been working with the senior class to, to start out with. Um, and it's it's great to have him on our administrative team, and we also uh, are really excited about what Mark Minucci has been bringing to the table for us in terms of looking at, you know, special ed considerations and regulations and procedures. And he has a wealth of information, and he's just a great person to to work with. Gets along well with with faculty and students and parents alike. So it's been great, and and uh, you know we're very optimistic about about the year there. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's also exciting in that it's the 150th graduating class. Um, I know there's been some discussions about that at this at this uh, committee as well, but you know we're looking at ways to really make that a special event as it is a unique opportunity uh, to highlight, I think, the history of Fitchburg High School. You know all that it's given to the city and and the city has afforded it to be able to do so we're kind of in initial talks about how to make it you know even more special than it already is and i always say that it's the best graduation there is but but adding that it's the 150th makes it i think extra special so it'll be exciting we have mr pierce here tonight who happens to also be the senior class advisor which you probably heard i think a little bit about when the red raiders were speaking so that'll be fun we're continuing and expanding our teaming models that we have. Uh, I think that that's worked very well at Fitchburg High to kind of, especially for the freshmen, but we've also added a few layers too, um, you know, with grade levels. And, you know, we realized last year that maybe it would be helpful to have a modified school in a school a programmatic piece for the sophomore year focused on English and math. So we added that in this year. Uh, in addition, we've enhanced the, the STEM team has continued on. We've added a few other staff members, teachers, into that role as well to really emphasize the science piece of it. Um, so, so I think, you know, if we look at the next slide, in addition to some of those other ones that are, that are posted, you know, we've been really happy about, you know, for the first few years, and the data is not available yet um, on the, in the Department of Ed, but... Our initial analysis seems positive and consistent, again, with what we've seen in terms of, you know, the, the freshman teams have really helped a lot of kids um, to be able to have a successful freshman year. And any of the research we've looked at really emphasizes that that's the critical year if a student is going to be successful or not in high school. So we're, we're actually in our first cohort that are seniors, and we phased in the school in a school first. And it's exciting to be able to sit down with a lot of these these kids, as Ray and I have been doing, um, and realize they're in good shape to graduate on time because they had a very successful freshman year. And maybe they've had a few bumps along the road since, but that year has really established that they're they're in they're in the ballpark of being able to graduate on time four year graduation. So. So it's positive, and I think that emphasizes how that's worked out really well, thanks to what the teachers and the students are doing. We don't have our graduation rate, but as you know, that is a piece of accountability for, for high school, and we've kept it pretty consistent at 80, 82, 81. Uh, we're hopeful it's going to be the same. You know, we don't anticipate anything different when that's released. It should be soon. Um, but but uh, again, I think a lot of what's going on around supporting students, you know, day to day has has been helping that that you know to increase to where we want it to be, which is ninety percent. I mean, that's our goal, and and I think that we you know will continue to work to to that until we get there, and then we'll set a new goal. Um, yeah. Thank you. So the dropout rate again, we're looking at that data now actually. Um, it's a very complex process of, of looking at the students who end up on that list. Sometimes they're surprising to us, um, sometimes not. Uh, anyway, you slice it, it's concerning. Um, you know, I think that as we looked at last year, we were so excited to have a lower than, a than state average dropout rate. And we're working through that right now, um, you know, with Eileen Spinney and some other folks to, to you know, in terms of the reporting. Uh, but again, I think we know every single student 
you know, in, in those situations. And we have a story about it. And we have uh, strategies that have been attempted and so forth. So, you know, I'm looking forward to when that's finalized. But, you know, I think, again, it's going to be very strong in terms of uh, Fitchburg High School's overall dropout rate. So our English MCAS scores, you know, this is uh, information that, that, you know, we're still kind of anticipating the park results that we did with juniors last year, current seniors. But our English results were as good as they've been. And we've had a couple of years in a row uh, where it's been strong performance to, to you know, again, very strong, the highest uh, advance and proficient that we, than, that we have seen at Fitchburg High. And tied with a couple of years back there at 83 percent. So, you know, we're hopeful again. We want to get to 90 percent, uh, but I think we're on the right track. And again, a lot of that has to do with the things that, you know, the teachers are doing, and also the focus on on school wide literacy. So that's our overall uh, demographic group, the entire uh, sophomore class from last year. And then high needs would be the next slide. I really we have a lot of the different colors. demographic groups. What are the colors? Could you just Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you go? Well, I, we can use it from. Yeah. From, so, so the dark same. blue is advanced. Yeah. The light blue is proficient. The pink, I guess it is, is uh, needs improvement. And then the red line is is failing. Um, so you can see English language arts high needs. We were plus seven from the previous year. The student growth percentage was 40. We'd like to see that higher ultimately. Uh, but, you know, in the range, as we'll see on the next slide that the Department of Ed gives, it's kind of in that range of what they what they where they want to see schools which is the next slide between 40 and 60 so we had higher uh, higher achievement there and solid growth so overall and, and again I think that's what we want to see though we'd like to be in the top right quadrant you know with 90 percent advanced and proficient and in and, and 60 percent student growth percentage and, and those kind of things so we have things to work on for sure but but definitely some positives there so math, unfortunately, I wish I could report the same. You know, we had a, we had sort of a down year, and uh, you know, we've been beating ourselves up about that and and trying to figure out, you know, what we need to do better to help our kids perform better. Um, so as you can see, you know, the the dark blues and the light blues aren't, aren't the really big columns there, um, and that's what we, you know, obviously ultimately expect from our students and ourselves. So. So that's what I think was so disappointing. It was that, that, you know, a lot of effort goes into analyzing data and setting open response seminars and looking at those results. And, you know, Mr. Pierce and the department really focusing on various aspects of, you know, the content that they feel, you know, is going to best prepare the students to show proficiency. And, and again, we didn't see enough of that. Um, you could you know, put the rose-colored glasses on and say, yeah, we reduced our failing a little bit, uh, and, and that is positive. But, you know, we have too much in the pink column there, and, and certainly we want to make that one smaller and the lights and dark blues much higher. So, so we have some plans afoot around that, but you can see on the, agri on the um, high need slide, too, it's similar. You know, we, we just didn't have a, a performance that we expected. And, and, and as I say it again, I emphasize, um, we really expected something different. And, you know, Galileo data and different data points that, you know, we were looking at, you know, showed us, I think, you know, what, what we were expecting was much more proficient at the very least. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really kind of trying to pull the layer of the onion back and look at ways that we can support kids to be able to access the math that they need to in order to be successful. And we've done a lot of school-wide things around literacy, and, and we'll try to do some of that with math, though it's tricky. You know, it's not quite the same. It's not as spiraled as in English is. You're always going to be reading, always going to be writing, always going to be speaking in an English content curriculum. As math, there's some real specific standards and, and strands in there that that not everybody can weigh in on. But we're hope to, hoping to look at some strategies that we can leverage that, that are sort of universal there. Um, so you can see, again, in the field goal chart, which I think is the next one, you know, we just kind of, we just tucked it into the, into the upright, you know, on the, on with the green dot. But again, we would rather see, you know, uh, up on the top right there, high growth, high performance, um, and that still remains the goal for, for us. And, and, and again, we just need to look at different things that we have to do a better job around. 
some of that has to do with um, you know uh, so some of the school wide things that we'll get into. The science and tech is also kind of uh, it's all over the place for us. Um, you know, we had when we look at science and technology. Uh, there's a number of different MCAS tests. We really focus on biology and technology engineering. Um, we, we do that in, in different ways. Uh, a lot of the freshman teams focus on technology engineering, uh, but there's also a piece of biology in there as well. So the, the, the state kind of separates out the MCAS uh, for high school science in two ways. They combine it in all grades, so 9 and 10, or they, or they separate it out by 10. So... We have, we have quite a few kids doing that, you know, at some point over the course of the year. And you can see we're below the state average. It's not, it's not where we want to be. Uh, we need to do a better job. And we've seen some disturbing trends as well that I think, um, you know, we're trying to highlight and emphasize ways that we can improve that, especially around increasing proficient. So I think if you go to, um, you know, so looking at, for example, biology, you know, we had a really great year in 2014, uh, and biology is a, trick one, a tricky one again too because it's given. It's the only one that's given twice. It's given in February and then it's given again in June, and we're really going to be now on the June cycle, whereas we, as a block schedule school, we're doing the two different cycles. And to get the assimilated data is not as easy as as you would think, uh, but overall. I think we've seen a lot of our Honors Academy students taking the biology because it's kind of a prep into the, as a pre-AP bio course into AP bio or AP environmental science. So, so our results had been, had been fairly solid there. And as I said, we really saw a strong performance in 2014. Um, if you just move that ahead, Eileen, thank you. So, so tech, yeah, let me, let me see if this, yeah, for some reason it doesn't, thank you. Anyway, the technology engineering one, we've only been doing it for three years. And we've done that with um, school within a school team. And then also uh, now we've added in the STEM teams. So w w the positive for us there is, you know, we really have reduced the number of students who, who have failed that um, and, and have focused around that, making sure kids pass. And so we've done a good job of cutting it down, you know, by more than half. Uh, but again, we want to see you know, that, that blue and dark blue columns get significantly taller than the other two. Um, that's, a, that's a challenging task, you know, in terms of, um, of doing that. But I think the new schedule should help with this in addition to some, some unified strategies that, that some of the teachers are using in the uh, techno. It's called Engineering the Future course that we've been doing. Let me see if it's working. Oh, very good. So as I said, we, you know, we have the literacy focus going at the school. It's been, we've been doing this for a number of years, um, and we will continue to do that, and we have good reason to do it. You know, we, we have to make sure our kids read at the, at the level they're going to need to in order to be, you know, effective in, in a college classroom or a career. Uh, so we do things like school-wide writings. We expect open response questions, seminars, and common assessments that include writing. You know, we do school-wide prompts that are more general. You know, we're thinking of some school-wide reading activities, too. We're looking at ways to do that. Uh, uh, we did one a couple of years ago on Malala Yousafzai, and she was very captivating to the students. They wrote some very poignant responses about, you know, a vi they had seen a little documentary about her and read an article. Um, so we were thinking of her book, which, you know, I think is, is very powerful. So, you know, we're, doing a, a num we're looking at a number of different ways to make sure that literacy re re remains a focus. And you can see our four-year open, open response comparison. You know, we've, we've been increasing in English, you know, slightly, but still increasing. And in bio, we've certainly been increasing. And, and basically what this shows is, I'll use bio as an example. On the biology MCAS test, there's 20 possible points on open response questions. So the year before we started really focusing on it, we were averaging six point, you know, a student would average 6.2 points out of 20. So last year was 9.6. So we've been increasing on that. Um, and technology engineering, we didn't, we didn't administer any exams that year, but we've gone from 5.3 up to 7.6. And again, in English, you know, we, we've kind of been, cons those two years we had the 83% uh, were pretty similar, but it was slightly higher this year. And again, I know I mentioned in math, we, we actually uh, struggled with it. 
last year, and we've looked at some of the questions and tried to figure out why. Um, so in terms of that, you know, we have some plans to to address intervention groups. We're actually looking to, for some folks to help with that. In addition, you know, the, the coaching cycles are really focusing on, you know, math and science and trying to help the teachers and each other figure out ways to, um, to address that. Um, you know, we also have uh, added in a staff member who's uh, focusing with our uh, English language learners in science, and we haven't really had that opportunity to be able to do that until this year, and I think that's going to be very beneficial. And as we've looked at data, we've looked at it whole school. You know, we've looked at it from the angle of, you know, what, what do, how do we all own this issue and what can we do about it and what can we try to do to, to support, you know, the, the growth that we have seen in areas like English so that, so that it can transfer over into, into science or math. Um, so we've been, there's other things too, but those are some of them. In terms of advanced placement progress, we definitely have seen some great, great growth there. Um, and, and certainly, you know, that's a very important indicator for students in terms of, you know, being transferable credits to almost every college and university in the, in the country. So you can see the year before we put the focus of working with Mass Insight into, into play, and then up to last year we had 118 kids pass AP tests, um, or 118 tests passed, uh, which is great because it's been more kids doing it, and you can see some of that progress there in terms of, you know, the number of tests taken and, and then the number of students involved in the program from 78 to 228 in just a couple of years, and, and then you can see some of the, uh, the demographic data there. You know, our largest demographic group is the uh, Latino population, and, um, you know, the year before Mass Insight, you know, they, there were only nine tests taken and three total students of Latino background participating in our AP program. So last year we had 123 tests taken and 41 students. So definitely, you know, significant growth in just a couple of years. And then you can see it even broken out further. I think the big one that we're really proud about because when we got into the program, you know, we wanted to make sure that, or other, or actually probably largest demographic group, ultimately the low income, was not represented in, in the AP courses as it should be. And so you can see that the growth from 52 tests taken in just a few years to 348 and 11 qualifying scores to 100 um, is certainly something that I think the teachers and students, I can tell you there were 70 students that went up to Murdoch High School uh, the the Saturday morning and and focused on AP language and lit and that was after all our homecoming stuff and then and then almost 500 of them showed up at the uh, well they were helping Mr. Pierce at the Hollis Hills farm and and also uh, going to the dance Saturday night so that was a packed weekend but we still had 70 kids go up to to focus just on AP training for about four hours on Saturday morning and it's showing up. So we've made that honor roll that College Board gives to about 500 schools in the country and Canada combined. And we anticipate from our College Board rep that we'll be on the sixth annual as well, so we're hopeful. Um, another thing I think that's big is, you know, we, we definitely have worked hard to, to, again, provide access to all our students for, you know, those kind of experiences that they're going to be had, have to be competitive with their peers across the country and the state. So one of the things is doing the PSAT and the SAT during the school day because our, our numbers were similar to what this article says here, which is about, you know, one in three urban students actually take the SAT. So ours is about now 100%. It's about all of them because we do it during the school day, and that's a big commitment by the district to ensure that, again, students have the experience to be able to take the PSAT a number of times and then the SAT. And it's not the end-all, be-all, but it still is used by a lot of colleges as a barometer of your college readiness to try to determine if you can manage a college classroom. So um, it's, it's a part of our mission, certainly, but it's a big part is to get, ready, get students ready for college. So the enrollment goal, we set a goal of 1,200 a few years back as a staff, and um, you know, we're glad to, to announce that even if, if we didn't have all the lovely pre-K students that we do, uh, we, we are above 1,200, 9 through 12. And so that's the important thing. And then when we add the little buggers, the little 4-year-old <laughs> Red Raiders, and we're at 1,272. So, so we're excited about that. And, and I think, again, what that tells us is, 
and we hear this anecdotally, but we also see it with some of the enrollment data that confidence is growing in, in the program that's offered by the teachers at Fitchburg High School. So I think that that's very positive. Um, and you can see the, the sort of trends there from 2007 to now. And 2007 was the year that the alt-ed uh, data was taken out of the Fitchburg High Enrollment. So moving forward, I mean, we need to, again, I mentioned a lot around college. We need to expand programming offerings uh, for careers. And so we're looking at some articulation agreement options for kids. We actually have our first meeting with teachers tomorrow to really look at how we can have some students graduate Fitchburg Higher with a certificate that would be a credential to a field. So we have one in mind, and we're going to work hard to make that happen. Uh, we got to do a better job with enhancing <clears throat> interventions, especially for students in, with math. You know, they have to, we have to figure out how to do that, and we have some plans to be able to do it, and some great people like Mr. Pierce and, and, and teachers working on that, but we'll get that done. Uh, adapting to the new master schedule is, is certainly, you know, one of the things we'll be focusing on throughout the course of the year. But as I said, it's, so far it's been great. You know, when we, when we talk about that, that programming around careers, we want to we make a pathway of some sort. And so we have some ideas around advanced manufacturing that I think could be very feasible. And according to the North Central Chamber of Commerce, that's a field that is under underemployed uh, right now. There are jobs available, and they're well-paying jobs. And, you know, I feel like we need to do, do our job of helping some students be able to leave Fitchburg High and say, you know what, I want to do that, and I want to get a job, and I want to do this kind of thing for my, for my career. So we're working on that with some folks uh, at, the, at the higher ed level. Um, you know, ultimately, we have to try to continue to move to level one. I mean, that's the goal for the school. There's no reason that we can't do it, and I believe that we will, you know, but we, we do need to do some, some things uh, uh, better. Um, you know, I think we've had some great success with working with the College Board around access, and now we want to see some results get even better. I mean, you, yeah, the results for the AP are great, and the access to the SAT, PSAT is excellent, but we want to make it even better, and again, I think our, our, our students and teachers are going to do that. Um, so the other piece is just finally, you know, continuing to emphasize what Fitchburg High School has to offer to the people of Fitchburg and, and, and even beyond because we do have, uh, you know, interest in it from, from those outside the city. And, and I think for good reason because there's a lot of great things happening here and, you know, we just need to make sure that that stays on the forefront of, of the message that we communicate, you know, in our actions and, and in our words as well. So. That's pretty much uh, the update of what's happening at Fitchburg High, and glad to answer any questions. Could you explain the process of what you guys are doing to analyze the math scores? I mean, I think, I think the the tough part to hear. I mean, it's just it's it's tough that we have to kind of live and die on these test scores. But yeah. the tough part to hear is that people were so surprised, right? So like sometimes you can have a cohort come through, sure. and it's not surprising, but. What, what, what is, what's the process of analysis, and when do you think you might kind of have Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of that already. Yeah. Um, you know, the process really is, I mean, it's, it's sometimes uh, a little bit of armchair quarterbacking, you know, when you're looking at a group that already took it. Right. But it does enable you, when you look at the MCAS and, and really focus on the types of questions that the students struggled with, why, you know, it, for example, you know, we've done whole school activities, meaning every teacher, gym, you know, guidance counselors, English, and we'll look at, we did this recently with some questions in the math, uh, MCAS, a recent one. You look at a question that you say, okay, a multiple choice question. And if A was the correct answer and 50% chose A, and B was an incorrect answer and 33% chose B, What's up with that? Like, why did so many kids choose B? What was so attractive about that particular response? And so we do it that way. You know, when we analyze the data, we try to look at those questions that stand out from that perspective. Obviously, the ones that we just really struggled on, you know, say 50% correct out of, out of, the, out of the group. Uh, but also those questions where a lot of students chose another option. And what about that, you know, it can inform our instruction or even a modification to curriculum. Um, sometimes we look at them and, you know, so recent, um, 
it's not a discovery so much as you know uh, uh, an analysis suggestion I guess is um, vocabulary you know did the students misinterpret the question did they did they read that question in a way that they will they were led to believe they had to do something different whereas it really didn't have too much with their content understanding so much as they just misunderstood what they were being asked to do and I think we've seen some of those you know which I think comes back to why we always need to focus on literacy too yeah. uh, another another you know we look at the open response questions too and there was a particular one from this year question 41 that many of the students got zero zero points or left it blank so so we had to look at that question and it was a long question involving um, calculating in interest principal and interest and in, in this kind of thing and again as we looked at that you know we tr we try to figure out okay what would trip the students up so that when we give the students the opportunity to simulate it the current sophomores in a classroom that the teachers have that in the back of their pockets already at last year's group if they see a similar similarly worded type of question what seemed to get in their way was whatever it might be um, so let's let's try to put them in the situation of practicing these types of questions on a test on a quiz uh, or as maybe a do now as an activator you know something that they come into the room let's do a problem real quick and then we'll get into what we're doing um, you know, I think what we also look at is the overall data of the current grades as they as they experience things prior. We use the early warning indicator system tool that gives us a lot of information about who are the kids that are going to need additional interventions, who are the ones that are going to need tutoring sessions, who are the ones that we're going to want to try to keep after school. With this new schedule, our plan is to do it during school, and I think we can do that, which we've never been able to do before. Um, so I, this, I don't know if this answers your question. Well, the only but. other thing that I was wondering is, is every math teacher involved in looking at the data? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, like I said, Mark, uh, Pierce, myself, some other folks, um, you know, establish those, those opportunities for, for teachers. But the very first thing the math teachers do is analyze the overall MCAS data and look at and then look at students that they currently have that have struggled and not just in math but in general you know maybe with grades maybe with other MCAS tests maybe with attendance because the, the early warning indi indicator has all of that data on it thank you you're welcome yeah um, boy what a absolutely hopeful and wonderful um, presentation thank you for bringing us all of this information I knew that we were doing we were having more kids doing more AP classes but hearing the the full range of it and al also the the rise in the number of um, Hispanic Latino kids taking this test um, what's the feeling among the students what, who are who are embarking on this test taking and I mean it seems like they've got to be having their horizons broadened in a way yeah. that is is significant you know as as a group what what have you observed there well i you know we have almost 600 enrollments right now and i think that it's been it's been transformative for the school and for also um, a lot of students from the perspective of you know i have conversations all the time with students and i know many of the teachers do around the idea of you know not whether you're going to do one but which one are you going to do and or we've also added in some uh some more college readiness type courses that re that earn college credit or at least put a student into the path of being uh, able to take credit bearing courses this is a significant issue nationally that students enter into college and then have to take remedial math or english and then of course they don't graduate because they they realize, wow, I'm spending money on courses that don't even count. So we now offer math modeling in FYE in our in our um, school day courses that are, are that will articulate to to uh, two year college anyway. So again, these are just the types of things that you know we have available so that our, you know we changed our sort of school improvement plan so that every student takes at least one of these types of classes, an AP or dual enrollment. Or some kind of college prep, college preparation course that's that's sanctioned by a college, whether it's the Mount or Fitchburg State, 
and again, it's it's really not whether it's going to happen, it's which one, you know. And, and then some kids, it's how many. You know, one of the things that, you know, with the new schedule, I look a couple kids, seven AP classes, six, five. So, so the problem we're having a little bit is manage you know let's have a manageable load so that you actually can take advantage of this this thing called sleep because it's kind of important and those are also you know you saw a couple of them tonight i mean those are the kids that want to do you know uh sport and then work and then do service and you know so six or seven aps is is a bigger load they're all college classes so that's a bigger load than is expected for a full-time college student um, so, so that's, you know, one little thing, but it's, it's a better, it's a good problem to have really there. Okay. Yeah. Can you um, talk a little bit about, um, you, when you were talking about uh, the, when you, uh, developing the career pathway, you yeah. said something about preparing them for is it advanced manufacturing. Can you give us Sure. So, idea? you know, we, we work with, uh, the Mount quite a bit through the gear up grant, but also, um, just in general. And, and a lot of our students are, you know, we, we, so we've looked at, right now we have college um, application challenge for our senior class. And our goal is to have 90% of the, the seniors apply to college by Thanksgiving. And then 100%, you know, by I think January 1st or whatever it is. So one of the things we have looked at though is that We've done a great job of getting students college eligible. You know, they can get into a college. They can get into the Mount. They can get into Fitchburg State. They can get into a private university here or there. But are they truly ready? You know, are they, are they actually ready for that rigor of, of the college experience? Some kids also, we kind of feel like, and we, in talking to them and some of, some of the feedback we've even gotten anecdotally from postgraduates, they they're more leaning towards you know um, a a career type of of pathway, and and so we just looked at ourselves and said you know we need to we need to, we're with the comprehensive high school in Fitchburg. I mean we need to do something for everybody, and we need to get them to what our mission says, which is college or career readiness. And and I think as we were honest about it, career readiness not such a great job. So. We've been talking to the Mount about, they have about 16, 17 different uh, licensed credentialing pathway programs that uh, an individual, adult, high school age student, whatever, um, if they complete them, they actually have a, a field credential. So the reason that we're looking at advanced manufacturing is that, and it's not the one that we'll ne necessarily do because of space issues, but I think we can figure it out it's there's jobs available and and that's based on you know the chambers of commerce and north central mass need employment needs and these are not just jobs that you know are are um barely able to provide for someone to to have a living but jobs where a career can be forged and you know a livelihood and you know a family supported and all of those things so so we want to, again, just have that as an option. You know, here's another option. You come to Fitchburg High School, you can take seven AP classes, but you can also, you know, have this option of potentially going in this direction so that you can, you can graduate high school and get a job that pays a, a, a living wage and, and one where you can support yourself and maybe some other people. So that's kind of our thinking around that. And, and again, it's, it's our mission, and we say we're going to do it, so we need to do it. Um, a couple of conversations I wonder if you would just be able to respond to. Um, I happen to be around a lot of eighth grade parents, and I think the sentiment that I hear is for anybody who, you know, feels fairly confident that their child might get into the Honors Academy, they feel really good about it. For yeah. the parents who think that their child will be in school within a school, they feel pretty good about it. Um, so what's the message to the other kids? Like, I know you have the STEM program, sure. but I have to say I don't really understand that, and I don't know if you Neither do we. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we're working on that. In yeah. fact, we're, we're, we have a meeting tomorrow, and our first uh, agenda item is define STEM so that it's clearly understood okay. by ourselves first. But, but by, because I think it means 
nothing and a lot at the same time. You know, it's the acronym for science, technology, right. you know, engineering and math. But but how do we articulate that? So we need to do a better job. So I think that you're asking the question is, is great fodder for the work we need to do. What I would say, though, to to any parent, and I do all the time, um, is that, you know, we do have – um, again, we're the comprehensive high school in Fitchburg, and we are going to provide opportunities for any student to be successful. Uh, we need to refine things and look at options like advanced manufacturing or some kind of career credential if it's not that. Um, but we have to have APs and we have to have you know hands-on courses and intervention-based programs and accelerants and all of those different things. So, you know, I, I, I think that our focus for the freshman year is that students come in and they, and, and they have uh, a team of folks who are working with them and, and helping them have a successful year at whatever level they're coming to us. You know, wherever they are, we meet them and we try to bring them through and then really have them branch off into, into the areas where, you know, they're going to find even more success. You know, the other thing that I think a lot of students take – take a lot, a great advantage of and have unbelievable experiences extracurriculars mm -hmm. you know in in the life of the school in the social sphere that that happens there and all those supports that can go along with that and we have a great you know uh, list of 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 offerings there and and so you know i i again i emphasize that fitchburg is a place for every kid and we don't, you know, delineate between this or that or the other. It's a place for every kid, and we take all kids, and we want to accept, you know, them where they are, meet them where they are, and help them, you know, find what they're interested in. If they're not, because, I, I you know, coming out of eighth grade, I wouldn't have been able to tell you, you know, what, what do you want to do? I, I don't know. Play football, you know, be in the <laughs> NFL, which at 5'8 is not likely, uh, and, and slow. 5'8 and slow, not likely. Um, so, you know, I think that um, we, again, I think we're working on that sort of definition around our STEM team so it can be clearer and, and folks can understand that because that's a good point. Thanks. That's You're welcome. Cool. I think just as a clarification, it sometimes happens. I think people hear Honors Academy. Yeah. I think you only take honors classes if you're in the honors that's academy. A, that's true. So I think that needs to be clarified that honors academy is a distinction of a particular group of students with right. teachers, but all the other classes are available to all the other students, including the honors programs, the AP courses, yeah, and all that's of that. Good so okay. yeah. it's just a distinction that needs to be made because I've also heard that implication. Yeah. Well, if my kid doesn't get in, then what's left for yeah, them? Yeah, right. And, and there's, as, as he was saying, everything, everything. is left yeah. for them. There's yeah. nothing that they're excluded from that if their ability is there, they can access all those courses. That's definitely something yeah. to keep educating yeah. parents about yeah. because I – well, even the majority of our AP enrollments are non-honors academy students. Yeah. You know, many of our honors levels right. are non-honors academy. So that's a that's a great point. So not to have us turn yeah. into something else when the pumpkins are. Did, did you have a question? Um, at the, uh, I'm going to move on because we still have three other principals and Thank their you. schools, and uh, all of them will be back later on mid-year. This is just kind of, uh, okay, here's where we are and where we're headed, and we'll see you again in January to give you an update. So thank you, Jeremy. Thanks Great a lot. Job. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks. You did that without the mascots, just, you know. Yes. So good. Uh, we're going to skip, the, change the order up a little bit, and I'm going to ask uh, Adam Renda to come up with uh, his team and do their presentation. Adam, if you can just introduce your team at the beginning. Hello. If you haven't changed these, we have these already. Well, so. I added slides oh, okay. about yep. the, um, the playground. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, I'm Adam Renda, the principal of Crocker Elementary. This is Casey Bolak, mm -hmm. uh, the assistant principal. And our new addition is Christine Gerard. She is the student program support administrator um, this year. So usually I'm up here talking about MCAS scores, but um, we don't have any. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Well, as he said, those are gone, right? Yeah, 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 gone. Right? Um, Very precious. That was good. 
Um, I'm looking forward to, to you know, presenting the park data when it's available, and, and that's going to be soon. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to talk about three of our academic goals, and then what I, I'm really excited to talk about is a um, social-emotional uh, initiative that um, is, is expanded from some, some of the things that we're doing last year. Um, all of our, our three academic goals, reading, writing, and mathematics, um, all essentially are the same. Uh, what we want to do um, is cut that achievement gap in half every year. So um, we're going to look at our state data <coughs> and our district assessments, which are uh, fairly abundant <coughs> and um, you know, great indicators of how we're going to do on, on state exams. Um, and we want to cut the needs improvement and, and warning kids in half by the end of the year. Um, so the important information of this is how we're going to do that. Um, for reading, um, we're going to continue doing tiered interventions. So these are when intervention is push, uh, push in to class. So um, students are picked for these interventions based on data. Uh, so it could be the classroom teacher giving the intervention. It could be a Title I uh, interventionist or uh, special education. Um, we're going to continue with um, the implementation of reading workshop with um, focus lessons from the FPS curriculum. Um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to see some of the work that the coaches and central office has done and some teachers on the ELA curriculum documents, but they're, they're unbelievable, and we're getting great feedback from our teachers using this, um, some of this, uh, these new documents, and um, you know, we're, we're sticking strong and, and um, using these with fidelity. Uh, we're going to continue with co-teaching, where special education teachers plan and teach with classroom teachers in the regular education um, uh, classroom. Um, so when you come in, if it's a co-teaching classroom, you could see um, a special ed teacher working possibly with a group of students without IEPs or, or vice versa. Um, one of my favorite parts of this is you can't tell um, who's on an IEP and who isn't. Um, we have higher expectations, some of that positive peer pressure that you see students uh, wanting to perform better and, and do some of the same work um, as their peers. Uh, we use walkthroughs to inform our professional development. We'll go through a classroom, um, you know, the administration team and coaches. Um, if we see a theme or, or some an area that needs to improve, we can almost have immediate professional development on that. It's usually about a week later when we have a, a focus group or um, collaborative lesson planning. Uh, which is actually the next bullet. Um, so collaborative lesson planning is where teachers plan as a grade level and with coaches to refine teaching and learning. Um, we did this all of last year and, and continuing to do it this year. And uh, we use the nine-day coaching cycle for both ELA and math. Um, coaches provide targeted modeling, support, reflection um, with a research-based instructional practice for teachers. So these, these approaches are, are, same, are the same for um, writing and math also, just done a little differently because of the, the content area. Um, we're using Lucy Calkins units of study for writing. Uh, we've had great success with it. We're staying with that. Um, and for math, really the only difference is we're using um, Engage New York program, Eureka Math. We, we did that school-wide uh, last year, and we're finding it easier to plan. Um, teachers have lived with this program for a year. We know where to supplement. Um, we know where we need more training. Um, we have a new math coach this year, uh, Robin Pierce. She's really um, picked up the baton and started running. It hasn't stopped yet. Um, so she's doing a great job. Gretchen Renault, our reading coach. Um, I think everybody knows Gretchen. Um, extremely talented coach yeah. who was in New York this weekend um, at the Teachers College, you know, on her own time, taking PD to, to help us improve. So I'm feeling very comfortable with what we're doing academically. Um, we have unbelievable teachers, great staff. Um, we are very lucky to have low turnover over the summer. So we kept the majority of our staff, and, and some of the teachers that we picked up were veterans, and we have um, some talented um, teachers right out of college who are taking advantage of those 90 coaching cycles. But what I'm really excited to talk about is the Growth Mindset Initiative. Um, so last year you heard me talk about counter narratives, stereotype threat, and some of the things that we were trying to, to do to counteract those. Um, we had some success, uh, but I think a lot of the times <coughs> with the first year of trying something new, um, you find out 
more what doesn't work uh, rather than find out, you know, that everything was planned perfectly and it um, did everything you wanted. So we found out what didn't work. And what we decided to do after a lot of reflection um, is, is start to focus on, on mindset. And um, we think this is a way where students can create their own counter narratives. Um, so what is mindset? Um, there's, there's a couple mindsets. A fixed mindset is when you believe that your innate abilities are fixed. You're born with a certain amount of intelligence, um, and that's it. And um, I'm very thankful that that isn't true because I wouldn't be up here speaking with you if it was. Um, growth mindset um, is the belief that these traits can grow and that the brain is malleable and like a muscle. And the more that you work it, um, the better you get at doing things and, and, and the more intelligent you can become. So there are some reasons that we need to foster this. Um, I think at Crocker School, 80% of our children, over 80% of our children are living with poverty or, um, yes, over 80%. Um, and we know that children who live in poverty are at a greater risk uh, for poor academic achievement, dropout, abuse, neglect, uh, behavioral issues. Um, you know, those, that list can go on and on. Um, we know that our students are constantly bombarded with images and messages that convey negativity and tell them why they can't do things, why they can't achieve. Um, we believe that this, message, that this message creates a fixed mindset and it makes life and school more difficult for them. So if we can find a way to foster a growth mindset in our students, we feel that this will help them embrace challenges um, with ambition and resiliency. So it's easy to say that, but um, this is what we're doing about it. Um, we're starting a mentoring program with some high school seniors. Um, we are going to do a book study on mindset in the classroom. Um, we're going to teach the science that the brain is malleable. Uh, we want the kids to know this. Um, we're going to have professional development on teacher language about praising the process. Um, we're infusing growth mindset into morning meeting and the greater community. And we're doing a possible <laughs> self-exercise and goal setting on how, how to become that self. Um, Mr. Bolak is going to talk to you about the mentoring program. Hi. Sorry. Um, so this is, the mentoring program is something we've tried to start the last couple of years. And this year it's really um, with kind of partnering up with the Gear Up program um, that Mr. Jokula mentioned earlier. Um, we've gotten three high school seniors so far. We're kind of putting a word out for some more. If they want to come and join us at Crocker School, that'd be great. Um, they're working specifically with our fourth grade students. Um, our admin team, our student support team, kind of created a, a risk of students that or we would classify as at risk. And so the first couple of weeks, they just went into our fourth grade classrooms, um, built their relationships, trying <coughs> to get to know the kids and the teachers, what kids are doing. Um, and so then, as they build those relationships, our students are able to see these kids that are really college and career ready, real life examples, not. Mr. Renda, or Mr. Rod, or Mr. Bolak saying, you can do it, you're going to do it great. Um, these kids that are living in their neighborhoods, that are going in the same school system, that are really, really ready, and they've made those choices already, and what do they have to do, and how do they do it? Um, and so we have one of our mentors that's already working with a small group in the classroom, going through a growth mindset type of lesson plan curriculum, and the other ones will be starting that either this week or next week, um, just to really build our fourth graders up and prepare them and get that internal kind of switch going as they move on to middle school because that's one of our major concerns is that transition from elementary to middle. So hopefully if we can get some more we'd like to have at least one if not two mentors in each of our fourth grade classroom and even bring it down to third grade. Um, so it's, it's been very, very successful so far and we're looking forward to seeing how it, how it kind of continues to grow. You know, we're hoping that um, <coughs> one of the things we worry about is we're, we're pretty good at building scaffolding in the school and making sure kids are successful. Um, one of the things we worry about is when that scaffolding is removed. You know, it, when they're at Crocker, a lot of the times they're there for five years. They're very used to how we do things, um, and then they leave, and they're someplace else. So we want to try to build that. We're hoping that this mindset can build that scaffolding internally. Um, so we are going to do a book study on mindset in the classroom. And this book, if you look at it, it really lays out a great plan on how um, you can infuse this into your school. We haven't done that yet, but I would like to talk to you more about it once that's done and we start implementing 
uh, more, more of these um, techniques. We're going to teach that the brain is malleable, um, and we already introduced neuroplasticity to, I, don't, I think I said it right, um, thank you, um, to you know about 500 kids. Um, and there's a great video on this link that did a great job introducing it much better than I could have. But um, you know the kids get it. Um, you know, and it's just the idea that the brain is plastic and it can grow. It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, we're teaching that to the kids in a much more technical way than how I just stated it. Um, also, uh, professional development on um, teacher language, how, why we should praise the process and not the ability. Um, what can happen if you praise the ability, you're so smart, for instance, is that may create an atmosphere where a student is afraid to take an academic risk because they're worried that if they get it wrong, we may, it may change our perception about how smart they are. So instead of saying, you're so smart, what we want to say is, I really like how you did this and, and explain why. Um, that will create an, an atmosphere, hopefully, where uh, taking academic risks is valued um, and kids feel safe doing it because we want them to make mistakes. Uh, we know that um, failure is data for future success. And I think some people at Crockerist could hear me say that. So that's okay. <laughs> so we're trying to infuse this in all aspects in the school, teacher language, in the classroom, um, at lunch, morning meetings, and our school-wide morning meetings. So teachers are, are provided with monthly themes on, on many lessons that promote growth mindset. Students are given opportunities to practice the theme and discuss it throughout the day. Guidance is joining in uh, morning meetings and presenting additional information about the themes. Um, and we're going to start giving, uh, during our school-wide morning meetings, we're going to start giving a mindset award um, where we're kind of celebrating some students that have shown um, you know, persistence and resiliency throughout the month. If you come in and see some of our bulletin boards, one of them, it's a big brain holding a weight, um, you know, which is trying to really promote this idea that you're going to you're going to become as intelligent as you work. Um, the next slide is about um, creating a possible self. Um, I think this is a good addition to hopes and dreams. So students will actually write what they want to be, how they want to treat people, how they want to be treated, how you know what they want to do for a future career. They can also, because if that's difficult, they can also create the, the, the self that they dread. So depending on which one they pick, and we're hoping that they're going with possible self, but if they start with dread, we'll start there and then get them to the possible self. Um, they're going to set goals on how to become that self or how not to become the self that they don't want to be. So they'll set a goal, and there's action steps. And when they reach that goal, we're going to celebrate it and help them plan more difficult goals to achieve. Um, so that's that's where we are with mindset. Um, you know, it's something that I'm very excited about. Um, it's one of those things I think teachers are going to hopefully. Uh, I'm going to say it so much they're going to get sick of hearing it, which I think is um, can be a positive in many ways. <laughs> Um, I added some pictures uh, to this presentation because over the weekend, the Crocker PTO, uh, along with Crossroad Church, um, just transformed our playground. Um, I, I mean, I guess there's really no other word. These pictures that are on here just don't do it justice. It was a tremendous amount of work. They spread over um, 100 yards of mulch. They painted all of the equipment. They painted three black, uh, the three black tops. If you've been in the back of Crocker, we have three levels of black tops that kids play on. Uh, they painted a full court basketball court on the on the bottom one. Uh, there's new backboards coming. I think they're going to be in tomorrow or the next day. Um, they, there's a ball game. I, I mean, it's been under the ramp for years. Um, they got that up. You throw the ball and it comes out a different shoot. I'm not sure what that's called. Um, there's walking tracks and four squares and, and car tracks and um, uh, hopscotch with sight words. And I, might want to, I mean, I'm sure I'm missing something. The oh, there's chalkboards that got mounted, plywood that got mounted on the, on the wall and painted with chalkboard paint. Um, we have some basketball rims for the kindergarten students that are set at six feet. Um, just a that tremendous. This is kind of the before and then the after. I mean, 100 yards of mulch. It's just um, it's very soft. Uh, when they when they fall there now, it's going to be. Um, you know, you know, much better for the first first graders in kindergarten, and you can see the full court basketball court that they painted down down the bottom. Um, 
just just a tremendous amount of work and there's um there's a lot of people to thank for that uh tammy tonry bolak our health teachers kind of started this as part of the fuel up to play grant and she presented it to our pto and then it, they took they just took it and ran um, a lot of our pto members uh, are part of the crossroads church that's how they got connected uh, with this and they just came in with a crew and um did a tremendous job. Um, Andrea Olet, our art teacher, kind of stenciled out a lot of the, um, the, the paintings that you see on the ground. Um, the CDC um, donated some resources, Reimagine North of Maine and Mock, Fitchburg State, Sherwin-Williams, uh, Fa the Fastenal Company, Expressos, Economy Paint, Girl Scouts, uh, tons of parent volunteers. Powell, uh, Powell Stone and Gravel donated, donated the mulch at cost, which was a huge savings, delivered it for free and found a way to dump 100 yards of mulch on top of the hill, mm -hmm. which saved a ton of time. Um, the DPW came in and scraped out all the dead grass in the playground and uh, delivered a couple of dumpsters. I mean, there's just, I'm probably missing some people, but the organization and the amount of people that were involved uh, and doing this was, was incredible. There's and to see the photographs on it, they really, yeah, they, there are. the video, the video is very it, cool. It's great, yeah. And the, the um, seeing the kids' faces this morning was, yeah. was kind of priceless. <laughs> I yeah. Can imagine. yeah, just jaws <laughs> dropped. I mean, it looked a lot different from Friday to this morning, so right. it, it was wonderful. Questions for Adam or his team? I think just a general comment on the mindset piece. I think this is. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about in terms of social emotional wellness uh, because you're essentially teaching kids um, how to how to think about what they're doing and also um, how to cope with it in a positive way not just a self-soothing way but a self-empowering way so I think this is frankly brilliant and um, just wanted to know how did this how did this particular thing come about uh, we had started doing some work Last year, um, I had a project for the fellowship that I had at Boston College where I was working on stereotype threat and um, helping students create a counter narrative. And when you, when you research that, there's, there's information, but there's not a lot to what to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, so by kind of failing at some of the initiatives that we, we came up with last year, um, we really came to the conclusion that mindset was the way to um, help students create their own counter narrative because we can't do it for them. Um, that just isn't going to work. Um, so it was, you know, between uh, presenting um, the problem that we were having, that I was having with stereotype threat and, and counter narrative at a consultancy that I'm a part of, and um, you know, brainstorming with with the admin team and guidance at Crocker. So that that's where it started, and um, everybody's the, the staff, guidance, um, the admin team have have really run with it, and it's making it much better than what my um, initial uh, vision was. I love that you're talking neuroplasticity with elementary yeah, school five -year -olds. kids. Yeah, five-year-olds. Yeah, we're doing that with high school kids, but those elementary kids are making all those neural connections yes, at much faster rate than everybody else. So that's great. Um, but I, I'm just kind of curious because all the interventions that you have, the co-teaching, the um, collaborative lesson planning, nine-day coaching cycle, like how? And that seems like a massive schedule undertaking yeah um, it is. and and what I mean are, are these things that how did you pull it off <laughs> I guess um, my question. so we have some some brilliant minds as far as scheduling goes and mine is not one of them um, but uh, we work at, at at times what we need to do with um, is pick the intervention that will move the student the most so there's definitely issues with someone should have all three, but you can't do it schedule-wise. So um, really how we do it is, is during data meetings, we talk with all the teachers involved with working with an individual student, um, and we make the decision where we think that student will, will move the most, and we try it. And we look again at the progress they're making after six weeks, and if they're not making it, we make a change. Um, so right not every not every teacher does a 90 coaching cycle every year um but a lot of them do um not every student can get special ed title one um and ell services all at the same time um not all of them qualify for them so it, it, it 
in a certain aspect, it looks more complicated than it is. But um, but all the teachers yeah. can plan as a grade level. So the teachers plan as a grade level because it happens at their prep. Um, so they all have the same prep, the grade grade level teachers, and we and we get the special education teacher that works with that grade level to have that prep also. So there's there, there's an opportunity for them to plan together. Um, there are times that can't happen because of testing schedules in special education meetings. So they share their plans on Google Docs. Uh, so there's input uh, that way. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask, what, what are the criteria that you use for choosing the um, mentors? Are there specific things you're looking for? Or? Not entirely. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, the reality is, is we're looking for kids that want to give back and tell their story, okay. um, wh whatever it is. Um, uh -huh. These high school seniors that are able, luckily at Crocker, we don't dismiss until 325. So the high school, we have a late dismissal. The high school can come out. We're not too far away. They can leave high school, hmm. come on down, and, and hang out with Real us in plus. the afternoon for 45 minutes. Um, and so we're looking for kids that are on track to graduate, mm -hmm. um, but also that have a story to tell that could be inspiring um, for our kids that just are looking for an answer sometimes. Especially from somebody else, maybe might come a little better. There are there is a possibility that we might get some middle school mentors from Long Joe. We're working with North to Maine and um, Melvin's last name. Oh, do you remember Marvin's last name? Excuse me, Marlon. Um, Marlon works with some students from Long Joe that he feels might be a good match at mentoring. So you know we're going to meet them and see if that's going to work. Um, we need more. Um, if anybody knows anyone who's interested. That would be a good candidate, please. That's what, well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I, I know if university students we would be definitely be interested in university know. students. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that we would love to do is bring a group of our fourth graders to visit Fitchburg State. Um, just, you know, I, ca I can't believe how many of them live in that neighborhood and haven't walked through the quad. It's just, it's kind of unreal. If you want to come visit any of my classes, you're welcome to. Okay, do I'm going to take you up on yeah, that. I think we've Thank made you. a link here. So. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you, Adam and your team. Okay. Good to hear the. We will all work on a new mindset. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite uh, McKay Arts Academy to come up, uh, Lourdes, and uh, you have uh, new team members here this year. Um, and, and introduce your team. from me you can <laughs> I'm Sarah Davis I'm one of the assistant principals I'm Becky Leva I am the student program support administrator I'm Jonathan Boyham I'm one of also the other vice principal at McKay as well I am Lourdes Ramirez I am the principal at McKay <laughs> and I am a Mac user so you have to bear with me here <laughs> Be flexible. Yeah. Are you looking for the the, the tool? Bolt. Yeah. Mr. Bolek looks like he's PC is a right tea buddy. <laughs> so we'll move to our first strategic goal and um, Using Title I data, um, we found that approximately 25% of our students in all grade require monetary and support services. So um, we are focusing on um, core instruction as well as um, interventions to support our students. So our teachers work um, with the coaches during common planning time and Adam talked a little bit about the opportunities that teachers have to work together during their prep time. So once a week the teachers meet either um, with the coaches um, and, um, and or um, with the admin team and then we work on um, goals um, in this particular um, 
instance, we have teachers looking at data and establishing specific, go specific goals for six to, to eight weeks and establishing specific learning targets that will then translate to the targets that they will be using in the classroom with students. One practice that we are consistently using in our classrooms is um, stating learning targets of behavioral objectives. So when students um, are in the classroom, they know at the beginning of class what they will be learning, the context in which they will be learning that material, and it also has a criteria for success. So they know the expected level of mastery of the particular activity um, within the lesson plan for that particular day. Connected to that, we have um, teachers utilizing formative assessments that would measure how successful were students in moving towards that goal or that mastery level that the lesson um, was created for. Um, we have um, teachers um, working on um, evaluating um, weekly team, during weekly team meetings um, the progress of the goals. And um, this is a very specific targeted way of teaching um, that has been uh, one of our focus this year. So at the end of class, teachers are then evaluating that formative data so students take, it could be in a form of an exit ticket, it could be in a form of um, a checking. Um, so the teacher would then utilize that data to create their next day lesson plan or to create an intervention group. So that way we know that teachers are targeting specifically what students need um, to move forward. Um, we utilize for math the Eure Eureka um, curriculum that, um, that the district um, has um, been implementing as well. And we are also taking advantage of the professional development opportunities um, for Eureka that the um, district um, has um, put forth. Could you please? <laughs> Thank you. Another goal that we have, that's not ours. I don't know. That looks like. I don't know if you have the last years up there. Does that look mm -hmm. like that? No, that looks like last years. Yeah, that does. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. I don't know why I can I connect this to that. Oh, you know. Huh? Um, you moved it over, right? One? October, MAA, right there to yeah, the left, right two, there. Yeah, you have two school committee yep. ones. Oh, look at that. Yep. Well, same school. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't choose it from the desktop, just so. It I didn't know that you had another <laughs> my case in there, so <laughs> so I apologize for that. Good, right here. Yes, thank you. So comprehension skills, okay. So um, improving reading um, comprehension skills, we know that would impact all areas of a student's academic life. And um, we are obviously focusing on that. And um, we are, um, as I began saying before, providing a rigorous core instruction that is rooted in, in the standards and implementing the reading and writing workshop and uh, we spoke in the past about um, using the reading workshop model um, to provide students with the opportunity to, um, to read to themselves, to read to someone, to listen to reading, and, um, and we have found great success with that. Um, so our goal is for students to engage in complex tests and tasks in a variety of genres and um, in the context of fostering high order thinking, and Sarah will talk later today about a lens that we're utilizing this year for 
basically everything that we do around professional development of higher order thinking and, um, and how we um, help students really understand the way they're thinking and to, um, for teachers to be mindful about how we challenge the way that students think around questioning and answering and responding to, to questions. So um, one of our goals is for students to um, craft evidence-based writing that is um, linked to the standards and that um, they are engaged in, in differentiated levels <coughs> of tasks and, um, and, um, and academic activities. So our middle school um, has opportunities to meet as a vertical team, which will not only pro, um, promote a rigorous progressions of concepts and skills, but it also allows us for our teachers to think about and plan for um, arts integration, and I'll speak a little bit more about that. So we are using coaching cycles, the nine-day coaching cycle, um, with the district coaches that um, allow for the coach to go into a classroom, observe um, the teacher, then sit down with the teacher and establish very specific goals for that coaching cycle. And then the coach will go in, model, and then they collaborate. At the end of the coaching cycle, I meet with the, the coach and with the, student, with the teacher that, um, that was involved in the cycle. And we are also utilizing our coaches, both the math and literacy coach, um, on demand um, support services, we call them. So teachers can invite the coaches anytime um, to come in and support them around a specific um, aspect of their practice. So during um, common planning team, um, the focus um, is on lesson planning and, and the data um, cycle that I spoke about um, before. So um, one of our goals for this year that aligns with our innovation plan um, is the development of a standards-based arts integration curriculum. And um, our goal is to have all pre-K to eight um, a, a curriculum map for our entire school um, eventually. So every grade level will then have a curriculum map that would be um, published um, for the general um, public consumption. And we are using um, a specific um, depository um, for those lessons to, um, to eventually live there and be accessible for people. So the coaches and teachers meet in grade level teams and the vertical teams to develop the curriculum maps and the benchmark planners. And um, we are looking to um, align classroom instruction um, to those curriculum maps. Another goal we have is to strengthen and expand community partnerships, in, um, especially with Fitchburg State University and the Fitchburg Art Museum. And our, our goal is for our staff to establish and implement at least one new community partnership this year that would enrich opportunities for our students in accessing um, Common Core standards. And um, we have had um, new initiatives already um, established this year. Um, we have a new partnership that we're working on with um, a music group um, from the university that provides instrumental lessons, and that's not um, a program that we have had in Mackay at the past, uh, in the past. So at this time, we're working with um, how we can collaborate with the university and provide students with that opportunity as well. Um, another partnership that we are currently working on is with Bridges Together, and um, this is a collaboration with um, the university and there was an anonymous donor that is funding this effort and it is an intergenerational program 
and we have volunteers from the Alpha program, the adult learners of Fitchburg from Fitchburg State University, and <coughs> they are volunteering um, to work with our third grade classes. We had a day long training um, with our third grade teachers and some of the Alpha um, members. So they will come into the classroom and do an array of activities um, with our <coughs> students. So the, um, they, they have referred to this program as a vac vaccine for ageism. So I think it's important for our students to have the opportunity to interact with um, more seasoned generations and to um, learn about and value the experiences um, that they bring to the table and um, to then um, have these activities that would allow them to compare some of the things, um, the way schools were before versus, um, versus the way that we educate children today and um, discuss some of the changes that have taken place um, around the world over time and then um, recognize that maybe we look different based on our age and our experiences but there are very um a lot of common things that that people have um in general um i'm very excited about this um effort and um we will begin our first cohort um in november so uh, all of our third grade classrooms will be engaged in this program um Another partnership um, that we have um, with the university that we continue to cultivate is with the science department. We have um, several professors that come into the science classrooms and they um, lecture with our science teachers um, in other, in the eighth grade in particular. In third grade, we have um, professors that come in with their students and facilitate scientific experiments and it's really exciting to um to have the opportunity and to access different materials and really um very hands a lot of hands-on activities um partners take an active role in the classroom in um, extracurricular activities um, in the past we have we had the um the math circle taking place after school and we have Dr. Rosa that leads this effort, and it's been an established program at McKay for the past three years or so. So she has students generally from the education department who come in after school and lead all these fun, hands-on activities um, that are um, to practice mathematical skills and concepts, and then I thought, this happens in third grade. At the end of third grade, students have established this relationship with these mentors, and then what? So I wanted to expand that to fourth grade, and um, we have the opportunity to do that to do that during the day with a different cohort of mentors um, and volunteers from the university. So we're doing a math lunch buddies. So a group of university students and um, Dr. Lamb and Dr. DeFrance are coming in to um, work um, with our fourth graders. And then we have the um, special education. So there's a couple different partnerships that we have started working um, with the college on in special education. Uh, one is we're working with a couple of the chairs of the moderate and severe disabilities um, professors. They're coming in and working with our teachers, mentoring our teachers and how to include students with more severe disabilities in the classroom. Um, and that's really turning out to be a great partnership, um, really enjoying that. And the other thing that is really exciting is um, we have a student who, we've had many students, but we had a particular student who was having a lot of communication needs. She, she couldn't communicate very well with her peers, um, with her family, and, but we noticed that she really was picking up on sign language from her speech pathologist and from her teachers. Um, so we developed a partnership with several um, students at the college, uh, one in particular that's coming in and teaching American Sign Language to the student and a group of her peers. 
um, as well as the parents so that she can not only communicate with just their speech and language pathologists, but also the peers in her classroom and her parents. So um, we're hoping to expand that as we go forward, but that, that's another really exciting one that we've started this year. So. We also have um, another group of students that comes into our kindergarten and teach, and she's teaching the kindergartners um, American Sign Language as well. Um, so that's um, another new initiative for this year. And then we continue our partnership with the Fitchware Art Museum and we are collaborating um, around professional development to um, support the elementary arts integration um, for visual arts um, effort. And um, we are coordinating for our expert middle school teachers to um, facilitate professional development in collaboration with the museum um, for the elementary teachers. And then we are working on student thinking. Okay. We'll move <laughs> over here so it's not so much, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz, man behind the screen type stuff. Um, due to the demands of the Common Core, as well as the necessity of uh, college and career readiness, and really the needs of each individual student success, so that kids are ready for their next step, whether it be seventh grade, eighth grade, high school, tech school, etc. We at McKay are really focusing on student thinking. And those three pieces, those three principles that we like to focus on is how and what are they thinking about, how we as the educators in the room can support them, and how as we as educators can really help them to develop it and engage it even further as thinkers. At McKay, we are fortunate enough to have humanities classes. So it works very closely with uh, social studies because it happens all in the same room. So these kids are also getting their nonfiction text, which the Common Core loves so much, as well as the opportunity to write creative pieces as well. <clears throat> and with the Common Core, every teacher is a literacy teacher now. So at every angle, at every subject, kids have an opportunity to really think deeply about what they want to do. And that literacy piece is going to come out through formative assessment <coughs> and summative assessments because kids are going to be writing more. The more they think, the more they write about what they think and the more deeper knowledge that they get. Um, we're really taking an opportunity at each level for the kids to really delve in to the things that they're really interested about. So gone are the days where we tell them what to write about. We're actually giving them a genre and say, okay, how can we really develop your thoughts and how can we go further with that? And kids are kind of taking it and running with it. So that's what we really want to encourage throughout the year through all grades. Um, even with the youngest, our youngest students when we're talking about reading, you know, why, what do you think the character did that? Why do you think you would do that in that t same type of situation. And we're really delving deeper for that rigor to meet the Common Core standards, as well as prepare them for their own lives and their own success. And this is the lens that would um, really um, color a lot of the professional development um, F, um, opportunities and workshops that we'll be providing for teachers because it's um, it's it's quite versatile right so student thinking in the in the in the context of math um, would look and, and and feel differently than in the context of, of ELA and the professional development will evolve around um, how do teachers push that thinking forward so it's um, how, how do I use the response from one student to build for the interaction with another student and, and how do we take an answer and challenge that answer for students to think even more deeply. So we'll finish out <clears throat> our presentation by talking about a focus on reading. Um, we are taking on reading, especially in our elementary grades this year, as a focus um, because we really want to um, cultivate the joy of reading and also a habit of reading among our students, among our staff, and among our families. 
We know that volume of reading is linked to vocabulary acquisition. We know that it's linked to overall achievement. So we think that this is a powerful lever in addition to our focus on student thinking for pushing student advancement forward at McKay. So we started to do this in three ways. Um, the first is to build incentives for at-home reading. And these are not incentives uh, such as a pizza party or um, something that is not related to reading. We want the things that you earn to be more reading. So for example, to have people come in, guests come in and read. For a classroom to have the opportunity to have more books. We want to have the incentives linked to more reading so that we continue to build that habit. Another piece that we are trying to work on is to stock our classroom libraries and our school-wide libraries with quality texts to fuel high-quality instruction in the classrooms. There are many inequities among classrooms, and we are working very hard right now to, um, uh, to, to level those so that every classroom has high-quality instructional text to work with. And then a final piece is that we're working on continuing to deepen staff understanding of the um, features of text at different levels, and also um, strategies that successful readers can use <coughs> so that they can strategically advance students and move them forward as readers. So that's another key piece of our work this year, too. And, and, and one of the activities that we're doing, it's um, we are creating a um, book bag for students um, for K and first grade to take home. So we are purchasing these um, little bags that we will um, fill with books that would be appropriate for, for particular children going back to targeted um, instruction. So they would be accessible at the reading level of particular, a particular child to then take home and, and then use that um, as another incentive. Um, reading is exciting, and we want students to become lifelong lovers of reading, and that's what we're working on. So lastly. So really, in order to make sure that we can achieve all these objectives and goals, is we really need to make sure that we have a positive school climate. Um, and there, it's no secret that McKay has had a little bit of turnover um, administratively the last couple of years. Um, so one of the goals or one of the things that we've really been working on is transforming or really improving our school culture. Um, last year, at the end of last year, uh, Lourdes led a book club on, um, they read the book Transforming School Culture by Anthony Muhammad um, with a group of teachers. Um, from that book study, a subcommittee came forward. Um, and so this year, that subcommittee is going to be working on um, developing a vision for our school culture, as well as an action plan that will include very specific activities, targeted activities to improve our school culture at McKay and to ensure that we have this um, positive student learning environment so that we can achieve all of these goals. Um, so there, there's already you know, some talk and some things um, in the works in terms of um, team building and how we can better use faculty meetings and, and things of that sort to, to you know, improve that culture. So. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, questions? Feedback? Well, I have a couple, and it has to do with the school culture. Um, so, are, so, how are the adults trans? Are, are, you, are you soliciting feedback? Are you trying to um, get a sense of the pulse of, you know, what, what teachers' experience is? Um, and then, so that's the first part. But then the second part I'm curious about is what role do the students have in creating the culture? Um, so so, um, so I'll take your second question yeah. first okay. because one of the things that we know is that um, teachers model behaviors and, and we are um, culture setters, right? And we know that in order for our community of students um, to be a safe and, and healthy environment, um, it begins with the teachers because uh, adults, I shouldn't say teacher, it's all staff, it's adult, because we model behaviors. In, and I always say students are always watching even mm -hmm. when you think they're not. And, and students are very, very perceptive. So it's important for us to be vigilant and uh, mindful about w the message that we portray or, or express because that's really what sets the tone um, for everyone. 
So um, one of the things that we are doing um, on, on Wednesday, we have a PD day. Um, it's really sitting down with teachers and, and talking about this is what we are, these are the challenges that we have been addressing and, and facing, and, and these are the supports available, and, and it's a more of a collaboration. It's a two-way conversation mm -hmm. because schools take everyone to come to the table and, and support each other and create partnerships and collaboration. That's what makes a school successful, and that's what we're doing. Because you, you are a unique school because you run K to 8. Mm -hmm. So you've, you know, I, it might be, I'm not sure if it's harder or easier for the middle school age kids to feel like they can help direct the school or, or not or have an active role in it. Um, so just kind of curious about yeah. that because I think it is such a unique mm -hmm. span. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it also provides, it may provide some challenges, but it also provides great opportunities. Mm -hmm. For example, we have classroom partners <laughs> where our sixth grade is partnered up with our second graders. And they come together and they do activities together and they... For this particular school year, and I will get into each of these in, in greater detail as we go through the presentation. Um, number one is let's reverse. I'd still be saying it's very limited, uh, but in fact, that's what it is. We don't we don't get a lot of information from this. Um, five percent of our students with learning disabilities in grade five scored advanced. That's the most that we've ever had. And then on our WIDA access, 65 out of the 99 ELL students had uh, student growth percentages of 40 or greater. So that was good. Um, the biggest cluster of students uh, in both grades is between that 214 and 224. 220 is the cutoff between warning and needs improvement. So on any given year, another open response question right bumps these kids up, bumps those kids down if they get a two instead of a three, so it's right in that area. So it's, um, <clears throat> we're close, but it's not something that you can say, well, we're gonna move these kids next year because those kids are now in sixth, they don't take MCAS science, <laughs> they won't take MCAS science again until eighth grade. And the other thing about those, <clears throat> those tests is they're cumulative. So <clears throat> what we teach in grade five or what we teach in grade eight is not what's on the test. It's everything from K through five and then through six, seven, and eight on that test. So it's very difficult for us to get a handle on saying, you know, we taught this, they should know this because the test is a guess from year to year. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that was interesting about this is uh, the kids had two rounds of park before they took the science test. So the state comes out with what they call the pre-release cutoff scores, where they just score the multiple choice, they haven't scored the open response. So that comes out, we look and they say, if you scored a 17, this is the level that you should be at. Well, I went through all that data, and it was significantly less after they scored the open response question than what they predicted. It would be almost like 10 percentage, 12 percentage points less. So um, my theory around that is a little bit of test fatigue on the open response since they've already had two rounds of park and then they were on science again. And I think that really played out in open response. Um, we'll have to look and compare it from, from last year. Uh, but fortunately this year there's only going to be one round of park. So hopefully that will take care of those things. So uh, limited, um, mixed news dropping in those those target categories but there there's still a majority in, in each of them is going to is going to score in that warning category. Um, one of our focus areas that we're working with DSAC is learning targets and we really want to focus in on what we want the kids to learn in that particular class that day. How will they know they learned it? What's their six success criteria and how does that look different for each of those kids? So last year at the end of the year, um, DSAC came through and, and conducted three days of walkthroughs. They went to each classroom uh, looking specifically at learning targets. They did things in terms of a quantitative approach, how many had learning targets up there, and then they did some qualitative stuff like how many were good, how many had success criteria, how many had that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> then we debriefed, and out of that we formed the PD plan for this year. So the DSAC is coming in uh, two days from now, as a matter of fact, on that half day. They're coming in on a full day on November 3rd, December 16th, and March 9th. Um, they're going to spend a full day on, on November 3rd, and we're going to really try to hit the vocabulary instruction. One of the, um, I don't want to say issues, one of the challenges is uh, in, in middle school, 
a lot of the vocabulary that we have to teach, we have to teach explicitly. But we also have to teach the vocabulary that gives them access to that vocabulary. So if you're a science teacher and you're going to be teaching units of measurement or um, parallel or some of those math terms, we also have to understand that we're going to have to teach them words like compute and sum and difference, those things that give them access to the curriculum. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, the staff as a whole is taking that SEI course. So what I'm hoping, we did not see a lot of that in the walkthrough. What I'm hoping is that they've internalized it and then it put it down on the board that it's in their plans, but we're going to find out um, because that's definitely something with our population that we're, we're going to have to pay attention to. And then the success criteria. We have a good handle on exit tickets and things like that, but I'm not sure that the kids have internalized. This is what I'm going to learn today, and this is how I will know that I've learned it. So uh, the observations and walkthroughs and stuff that we've done, we've seen various um, collective exit tickets and individual ones. They seem to have that down. I'm not sure that it is um, internalized to the degree we, we need it to be for students. And again, differentiated for staff. Um, the math people in their standards are a lot more uh, conducive to specific learning targets. I think it gets delineated the further out you go. And then um, in science and social studies, as has been alluded to earlier, they're all literacy teachers, but it's also difficult to get that into when you're trying to teach a specific content area as well. So we're going to have to differentiate that. And then we get to the specialists who have um, kids in six-week cycles and have each grade every day. So their learning targets are going to be different. So we are, we're going to have to differentiate as well. Uh, we're going to continue our co-teaching inclusion. And um, scheduling is, is very much a challenge in that. But we had two uh, pilot programs last year in sixth grade. And we've expanded that. Uh, those kids in sixth grade are doing it in seventh. We've moved it into eighth. And we've started a program in fifth. And when I say um, co-teaching inclusion, I mean a formal pilot program that our external consultant comes in and does PD with those people, not the um, there are kids here in this room that have inclusion on the IP, so we've got to find someone to go in there and go that to make it fit the schedule. I mean that. Uh, we've designed um, their common prep, prep period so that they plan together, that they don't have their pull-ups, that their kids that they would normally have for pull-ups have been um, funneled off to someone else. Um, the, the big thing with um, co-teaching inclusion learning targets, it's all the same thing. We want to be careful that we're not looking at telling teachers, well, here's another different thing that you have to do. It's, it's all the same thing. Uh, this summer, all three uh, memorial administrators and 10 other teachers took the universal design for learning class that was over here. So that, that's a big help. Cass did that. And when I worked with the district consultant, she thought that was, that was great stuff. So it kind of all fits together. We need that template. It seems like it's more work until you actually get, get into it and realize that's a template that you can use for every period. We did need a lot of district support in scheduling. Uh, we had a number of kids that were that come up in mid in mid uh, evaluation cycles that we don't know where they're going to land up. We have a number of students who are both ESL students and SPED students. That the minutes are two conflicting mandates, uh, and then we have um, the certification issues in the upper grades where. Um, the elementary certification no longer carries in grades 7 and 8. So if a student's going to get math, it has to be with a math teacher. Typically, most of our uh, SPED teachers, the ESL teachers, don't have that dual certification. So it's very, very challenging. Um, but we worked hard on that, made sure that those people who are co-teaching um, have common planning time, and that we're trying to put the uh, appropriate supports for both inclusion and pull-out. Um, during that common planning time, during a typical month, um, we take one period a week. Um, one period for, like, say, grade 7 would be they would meet with myself, guidance counselors. Uh, two weeks out of that month, they would meet with the coaches, and then they would meet as a grade level with administration, but they would be driving the agenda for that. So that's what we do every month. Um, we are following up our health and wellness initiative. I copied in here the... Um, the actual RFP for this this program. This is a natural outgrowth of our Fuel Up to Play 60. You heard from uh, Caden Scarpelletti earlier this 
earlier this year how she went to uh, Chicago. Um, matter of fact, Wednesday we're doing another Fuel Up to Play walk uh, to benefit breast cancer. But this is something we've already had a meeting in Westboro. It's a team Jill was here earlier, our cafeteria manager. So we're trying to get that. Um, one of the um, interesting things when we get parked back, because we did it on paper, um, we were able to start the testing at the same time for everybody and do it the whole year. So <clears throat> in the spring, there were a couple of test sessions where we did a walk as a school before we took the test. So I'll be interested in seeing if that had any impact on this whatsoever. But <clears throat> we've already had uh, one walk this year. We're starting our second one. And uh, Monday is a meeting in Marlboro to continue this teamwork here for um, our health and wellness initiative. And lastly, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I titled this Park Online. We're going to continue our John Collins work, the writing program. Uh, that PD is uh, slated for November 18th, February 3rd, and May 25th. Uh, we've been doing this for a while, but we also have seven new staff members as well as a new uh, assistant principal. And <clears throat> we did take Park last year on paper. It is uh, completely different uh, to take it online. So one of the things that we're doing is we're going to do all our district ben benchmarks online. Um, next week, we're going to have uh, sixth graders doing their own formative assessments. They're taking all the Chromebook carts, and they're going to do it all together at the same time to make sure that we don't have any glitches there. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about Park, um, <clears throat> when you're doing it online, all those amendments, accommodations, and all that stuff have to be uploaded in time um, so that because those accommodations are going to happen online. And so we really have to make sure that our evaluation cycles are completed in time and any amendments are done in time to get those accommodations into the uploaded before we take that test. So that's, that's also different for us. It should be easier, but it's the first time we've done it, so it's going to be a challenging. Um, one thing that we're doing that's different this year that's a pilot uh, kind of for the district, we had a uh, social worker who moved on to uh, a similar uh, position at McKay. We're going to fill that with a school psychologist. Uh, typically in the past they have been a district resource that moves from school to school. This is going to be full time at Memorial for our case law. They, um, she will also be able to run those lunch groups and those sorts of things, but it should speed up our assessment process when we do that, when we get kids who are referred, take tests, and she will also be able to do some more proactive stuff and some therapeutic stuff. So we're really excited about that, uh, working with Rowan and Alicia in uh, people services in SPED trying to get this model to work out. And so uh, I expect that there'll be some tweaks that we have to do along the line, but I'm very excited about that uh, particular process. So I tried to make this as quick as possible. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. So if the state decides not to go with park next month or a few weeks from now, does, are, we, are you giving park online in the spring, or is it still? I think we do it this year regardless. Yeah. Right now, everything's up in the air. So that's a huge issue for schools as yeah. they try to plan any approach to this testing. Yeah. Well, we should have our answer soon. The Board of right. Ed meeting is November, beginning of November. Right. So. There were two schools that participated in park with paper, McKay, mm -hmm. and Memorial. So this year, if Park was it, the district would need to have all of it online. Okay. Well, you're ready. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully we will be. We're going to be working on it anyways. Any other questions? Okay. Thank okay, you. Well, Thank you. Um, Andre said that we'd be back in January, and I know that um, some of you folks won't be uh, for whatever reason. So I'd just like to say... Um, this is my 16th year as principal and uh, 19th year, I believe, as an administrator. And I just want to thank this group uh, for your thoughtfulness and your diligence. Uh, there's been a lot of people here, and there's been a lot of times when a superintendent has asked me to go before the school committee, and I'd be going like, really? Like, <laughs> I, I know there's going to be oh, really? some inane questions. <laughs> there's going to be this. So I, I just want to thank you all for your service uh, collectively. And... Uh, I wish you well in your future endeavors. It's nice to you. that long practice. I know. <laughs> yeah. And you came as a Title I teacher. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, 16 years as the principal of a middle school, I think we should be thanking you for yeah. service. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, Fran. Okay. I think we're ready to move on to the action items.
Uh, we didn't go over the grants. How long do you have? Sure. You want to just quickly? So we have. Um, we're submitting the 21st Century Enhanced Funds Grant, <laughs> and that's for um, for Crocker in particular, and to provide resources specifically to include additional special education students. Um, in the past, we've hired uh, BCBA for the summer program, paraprofessionals, and during the school year program, um, a consultant to help design uh, learning opportunities so that the integration of the STEM students is pretty seamless. Um, we're also um, asking you to accept a series of grants that we've received. Um, supplementary support for at-risk high school students, um, and though that will uh, be embedded in some of the MCAS support programs at Fitchburg High. Uh, quality enhancement uh, for ELL students. This is a new grant, um, and it's very similar to the 21st century enhanced funds, but it's not 21st century money. Um, the, the opportunity we had this summer to integrate an additional 15 <coughs> very um, high need special education students into the 21st century program was pretty spectacular. Uh, they were fully included in all of the science, STEM, hands-on, arts, drama, everything the 21st Century program did with the help of a special ed teacher, a BCBA for behavior plans. Uh, the, the students were extremely successful. And this program for ELL students is modeled on that. So we're looking at targeting a cohort of um, upper elementary to middle school ELL students and integrating them into the 21st century program with similar kinds of support. Administering that uh, uh, all of these programs have a little mini administrator during the summer. Uh, Bonnie is responsible for getting it up and running and des uh, designing it, but it will be embedded within the 21st century program because it will be probably 15 or so students. Um, it's not a standalone program. And then the last is the Perkins grant, um, and this is entitlement money. Uh, the high school is submitting it. It runs for this school year, and it's a pretty traditional Perkins grant for um, technology, a piece of a salary, and um, the, uh, some of the activities in the Perkins grant are coming out of the coordinated program review. They really, the Department of Ed is really asking the high school to reinvigorate its um, workforce um, consultant, as you heard from Jeremy. They've already started doing the work where they're looking at the workforce needs in Central Mass, working with uh, folks in the field and consulting about um, articulations with courses. And you know, the high-end manufacturing is only one. They're looking at about a half a dozen possible articulations, but working with the industry folks to do that. And that's what the Perkins Grant helps support. That's it. All right. So I'm about to speak. So unless the school committee members have anything else to say, we're going to move on to the action items. First one is the approval of the buddy bench donation. Motion to accept it. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 613 is the royalty from Pearson Education. Motion. Second. Motion made and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, 614 is our investment of school choice funds. Motion to spend the funds. <laughs> second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. 615, this is to submit the grant, um, 21st century. Motion made. Second. Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 616 is to accept grants. Motion to accept the grants. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 617 is the um, recommendation to delete the network etiquette policy. Motion to delete. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Last one is the dead warrant, 466,000. Motion to pay the bill. Second. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Second session, is there a move to adjourn? Motion. Second. Anybody, anybody opposed? <laughs> We're adjourned. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it at all. Yeah. No. Yeah. Email it.